you questioning if God is good. And if that's you this morning, I just want to tell you that you can trust him and that even when things seem to be at their very worst, 
God is working it for your good. And he just wants you to have a little bit of faith. Because the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you don't have to have much, just a little, little bit. And he can move the mountains, right? Worship with us as we sing this night. your heads with me for just a second.
Heavenly Father, we believe you for great things in this place today, Lord. We believe that in you your promises are yes and amen. Father, we lift you up this morning and we thank you, God, for your goodness and mercy. Lord, this is a hard day. I lift up Sydney to you, Father, as she, she leaves us today, Father, and goes to a bright future ahead of her, Father. Just ask you, God, to help us, as, help me as a dad, and help us as a church to continue to lift her up in prayer. God, we put her in your hands, and we put everything we have and everything that we are in your hands, Father. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, God, and we pray, Lord, that you just show us just a little glimpse of your glory in this place today, Father. God, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. And we lift this little sacrifice of praise up to you, Father. And we love you, Lord. And we love your Son, and it's in his mighty name that we all say, Amen. Lord, help me. And my life is yours. And my hope is in you only and my heart you hold cause you make this sinner holy and
How many thankful this morning for, the, for God's goodness and His mercy and His love? His glory is indescribable. It is so beautiful. I'm th- so grateful today that as we stand in this place this morning that we can lift our voices and sing and we can just begin to put our, out of our minds all the stuff, all the struggles, all the questions, every mountain, every valley, whatever your life right now is described by, whatever metaphor you're using, the focus of worship is that we come in and that we put Him, we lift Him up, we put Him first. We say, God, it's all about You. It's all about Your glory. Your glory is so beautiful. Fill our hearts, Holy Spirit, in this place right now. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Your glory is so beautiful. seated this morning. Uh, Jeff, would you stay on the guitar for just a second, if you don't mind? Uh, As the praise team is dismissed today, Sydney, would you come forward? I want to pray for you and have the congregation stretch out their hands today. It's been an honor and a privilege to see this young woman grow up from a little girl here in the church and I am, in the right sense of the word, have a little bit of pride to say that I have had an opportunity to make an investment into her life musically, having taught her piano for, gosh, I don't know how many years, 10 years, okay? And uh, having her mature and develop her skill enough to actually join us on our Sunday morning service. She's been faithful faithful to a T, whatever that means, but should be faithful to an F, I guess, I don't know, but faithful all the way through on Wednesday nights, serving in our wired youth ministry, worship ministry, and contributing so much, blessing multiple generations, sitting in both of these services on Sunday morning, and then her own generation on Wednesday night. She leaves this afternoon for basic training for the National Guard, and then will be taking advantage of the program offered by our government for her education to be paid for. So that's exciting for her and her parents are thankful. (laughs) So this morning, if you would, while you're seated, would you just stretch out your hand towards Sid? We want to pray for her. We want to bless her. I'm thankful for multiple generations, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents who've walked with the Lord. And folk who don't have that blessing, that privilege, of of experiencing that don't have a clue what you're missing out and you're walking in the blessings of prayers that have been prayed for you before you were ever born and so as we stretch our hand out to you today Sydney Sydney Grafton woman of destiny woman of God thank you for the privilege over the years to input to encourage to strengthen to adjust Lord to sharpen to focus Thank you, O God, for your hand of blessing and protection that is resting upon her. Be, O Lord, the the shield and the sword. Be the staff. You are her shepherd and she shall not want. We declare that promise of God over her. Thank you for the wisdom of the Lord as she is confronted with new opportunities and faith to arise and meet the challenge. Wisdom to make the right decision. Grace, Lord, to deal with difficult people. Lord, thank you that in every one of those circumstances that you walk with her and that you bless her. Lord, in the words that she speaks, in her rising up and her sitting down and her going out, that the name of the Lord may be praised. Thank you, O God, for your hand of blessing and protection upon Sidney Grafton's life. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray and everybody said, amen. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. 
We love Sydney. She's going to be out, I think, about probably about seven months, maybe home for uh, Christmas for a few days. So just really excited to see the great things that are going to be coming her way in the future that is in front of her. Um, this morning is number five in this series that we've been doing called Dig Down Deeper. We've taken the passage in Matthew 11 that is familiar to all of us, used many times in an evangelistic sense of uh, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Another translation says, I won't put on you a burden that's too heavy or a yoke that is ill-fitting. God has a custom-tailored calling, purpose, destiny, direction, function, activity. The things that you do should be moving you toward the fulfillment of those purposes of God in your life. This morning, as we look, the message today is about fasting. And I know that's not a topic that you're just going to really jump up and down about. Because it's one really that I think probably the current church sort of ignores uh, or at least excuses itself from. The spiritual disciplines that we have been looking at came from the passage that I quoted just a moment ago. And that is that the yoke of the Lord is the idea in the Middle East. It is the concept of following alongside a teacher, a mentor, a guru. Don't, don't get offended at that term. I know it's Eastern in its origin, but it's still very apropos. Following behind a rabbi, a master, becoming a student, becoming a disciple, learning to do life alongside them. It's not a classroom set of principles that you can take notes and memorize, but it's really more of an osmotic kind of osmosis, just sort of soaking in the way Jesus does what he does. The 12 that were chosen to walk with him saw him in the marketplace. They saw him healing the sick. They saw him grieving when Lazarus was dead and cried out to God because of his love for his friend. They saw him touch leprous people that were considered to be untouchable. They saw him deal with overtly religious people, hypocrites, hypocrites, those who were below the criterion, the, the standard that they were themselves proclaiming. And how Jesus dealt with all of those circumstances is the yoke of training that he invites us into so that we can learn to do what Jesus did because that's what a disciple does. Jesus did it. Jesus did it and the disciples watched. The disciples did it and Jesus watched. And then when they graduated from Jesus University, the disciples did it and then they became the apostles sent into all the world. That particular metaphor or idea of spiritual maturity has never left us. In our American culture, the best way to identify are a couple of occupations which learn from there is a little bit of classroom study, but if you want to become a master electrician, you become a journeyman. You go on the journey with, you take up the yoke, and you watch the master electrician do what he or she does. They step back and say, you've watched me do this, now you do it and I will watch you. They make adjustments and corrections when necessary. Once you can be trusted, they say, okay, you do all of that work at this job site, and then when you finish that, come, I want to teach you something a little bit more complex. So an electrician, a plumber, still both have those kinds of discipleship um, learning modes because it's not just uh, classroom principles, but it's walking alongside a journeyman following a master. And so we take up the yoke of Jesus and we can learn to be his disciples and do what Jesus did with the same authority that Jesus did and spoke, the power that Jesus operated in, when we are willing to do the disciplines that Jesus practiced. 
So the principle of the yoke is, is that I learned to, to follow him and watch him. Jesus got up a great while before day and went into a solitary place and prayed. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about the word. When Jesus was tempted of the enemy, every time he quoted the word back to Satan, Satan, the adversary, the one who buffets, the one who comes against us. Jesus declared every set of circumstances, spirit, soul, and body. He had fasted for 40 days, and he was hungry. And the first thing the enemy did was tempt him in his point of weakness. The devil has no new tricks, no new cards up his sleeve. He does the same thing to me and you. An area where you are weak or struggling in, don't even look at me in that tone, because everybody in the room's got one sometime or another. Maybe everybody's flying high, and you're... Your, your faith tank is filled to the, and it's just jostling over. But there are seasons where you're running on fumes. Can I just be the first one to, te- to confess and say, look, I've been there and I, I know what it is to be pulling up from my toes going, God, I don't know if I'm going to make this, but I, I'm going to lean into you. I need your grace. I need your strength. And in those moments is when the enemy will come and dangle your flavor in front of you. And how many of you know your flavor is not your brother's or your sister's flavor that's across the aisle there? Everybody in the room has got a flavor. Don't care. Don't even look at me like that. The, the difference in victories a lot of other churches is that we, we try to just be really truthful and real about it. Most places ignore all of that and want to act like we're all bigger than that. And let me just tell you something. Honey, everybody in the room's human. There's nobody in the room who's not. I don't know of any aliens that are here. If you are, see me after the service, okay? Um, But everybody in the room is tempted. Jesus was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. He's the only one in human history who can testify to that. And so this morning our focus is on Him. How can we look to Him? How can we learn from Him? We pray like He prayed. We get in the Word like He got in the Word. We learn to quote the Word, meditate the Word, study the Word, memorize the Word, so that in the season that I need it, I can send down a bucket and I can draw up fresh water from the Word in the heart, in my soul. I learned to worship the way Jesus worshiped. I learned to fast. This morning is number five. Fasting. The text is found in Matthew chapter 6, three verses, verses 16 through 18, and it says, and what, and what, and is it on the screen? There it is, and what? Everybody say, when. When. When you fast, this comes from the text where Jesus says, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. It didn't say if any of those things. Because why? Because believers pray. Disciples give. Followers of Jesus fast. When you fast, he says, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites below the criteria the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. So, you know, certainly not, I'm really not thinking of any body, period. I just want that to be said. But I can remember over the years the attention-seeking behavior of some insecure believers who would be fasting and they wanted to make sure that everybody around them knew that they were fasting. Oh, well, I'm, I'm fasting today, and I'm going, okay, well, you just got your reward right there, brother. That's it. Okay, this is the only reward they'll ever get. Verse 17. But when you fast, my goodness, this is, this is bonehead kingdom right here. This is a bar of soap. Put it under here. Comb your hair and wash your face. Can you believe that even has to be in the Bible? I, I just, I'm shocked sometimes, I, I, and especially, forgive me, I'm going to say it, but when I go to Walmart and I'm just going, you came up here looking like that? I, I just, I, I mean, it just, it, it blows my mind. And, and forgive me, I don't want to sound judgmental. I don't think you've got to just come out, out of the band box every time you go somewhere. Certainly, if you've been working in the yard all day long, I understand you got to run, get something real quick. But man, I mean, it's just like, can you even tr- comb your hair in the name of Jesus? Wash your face in the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Verse 18, then no one will notice that you're fasting except your Father who knows what you do in private and your Father who sees everything will reward you. So there's some things that we want to do 
not for the purpose of public attention, but for the purpose of private audience with the Father. When you fast, Jesus says, this is how you do it. One thing, my one thing that I want to bring repeatedly through the message this morning is this. Fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me properly aligned to receive it. Now, that's a common misconception that folk think, well, if I fast, then God will have to do this for me. If I quote the right faith scripture, if I do this long enough, repetitively enough, if I go without this many meals, if I fast, then I can sort of strong arm God and make him do what I want him to do. And that's not at all the right attitude about fasting. I am not trying to wrestle anything out of God's hands because I am his child, you are his son, you are his daughter. And the scripture says in Ephesians 1, 3, that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has, past tense, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. They're already yours. We have a benevolent Father, a God who is good. Say, everybody say it all the time. And His heart is for you. He, he is after your, your advancement in the sense of the destiny and purpose that He has on your life. If God is guiding you into something, He's going to provide you with what you need to accomplish where He's guiding you. God's not going to tell you to do something and then leave you out there on a lurch. He is not going to give you a commandment that He expects you to obey and then not give you the strength and the grace and the provision to carry out His command. Somebody say amen. Fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me properly aligned to receive it. Now, like you all mean it from the first time, let's just do it once. So heartily, 100%, give it to me. Fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me properly aligned to receive it. I've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Sometimes I can get in my own way to seeing those things manifested in my life out of the invisible realm of the spirit into the visible realm from the eternal into the temporary and faith is the key that opens the door to those blessings prayer God moves fasting gets me aligned so that I can receive the blessings of God now number one it's important uh, that we recognize what fasting is I want to define fasting fasting Matter of fact, let me just go ahead and pull up my phone over here because I grabbed that earlier. It says to abstain from all or some kinds of food or drink, especially as a religious observance. And that's true. Although fasting is not only about food. There have been seasons where I have fasted social media for 30 days. Didn't get on Facebook, didn't get on Instagram, didn't tweet didn't do any of those things, just stayed away from it because it can keep you in a stirred up, angry kind of a mood, especially in these days of extreme political division. And so there are seasons that I have fasted that. There are seasons that I've turned the TV off. And it's not just about deprivation. It is intentional deprivation, but it's not just about doing without something. It's not just about starvation when it comes to food because if that were the case the starving people of the world would be operating in unexplainable spiritual power. Starvation is one thing. Intentionally depriving myself of something that I desire and something that I want and actually my body does need for the purpose of focusing that time and my attention on spiritual things, prayer, worship, reading of the Word, seeking the face of God. That's when... Fasting becomes, and this is my two-word definition, fasting is intensified prayer. Everybody say that. Intensified prayer. It is exponential power. So the title of the message this morning is The Potential. You see the word potent in the word potential. Potent, which means powerful. There is power when you understand the tool that God has given us in fasting, where we do without something for a specified duration, whether it's just one meal and we give 15, 20 minutes to seeking the Lord about a sense of direction in our lives for where we're headed, 
provision that's needed, a breakthrough in an area, a healing where it's not yet come, um, a, a, a restoration in a relationship, reconciliation where people have been divided so that peace might come, so that there can be healing and unity. Fasting can accomplish a lot of different things. It's just taking your prayer and bumping it up about three notches. It is the exponential notation of prayer in the kingdom of God. It's prayer to the third power. So it's intensified prayer when I begin to seek His face and pray and worship. Another longer definition says prayer, fasting is the willful refrainment from eating and sometimes drinking from a purely physiological context, fasting may refer to the metabolic status of a person who has not eaten overnight. I don't know if you know this, but that's why we call the first meal of the day breakfast. Your breakfast is where you break your overnight fast, okay? And so you've been doing without. And let me just stop and, and, and give a little quick, tiny little snippet of a sort of a recommendation. What got me on this journey back to getting my health was intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is the intention, intentional doing without food for protracted periods of time, and it doesn't always have to be for a one day, two days, three days, 10 days, 21 days, 40 days, as we see people do in the Bible, which I think when you're moving in that area, it's, it's moving into the miraculous, okay? Although, let me just say this, a lot of the battles we face are more mental than anything else. It's like running a marathon. You know, if you can run 10... If you can run 10, 13, 15 miles, you can do 26. It's just those last six or seven that are going to all be a mental game. It's going to be a mental battle as to whether or not you're going to keep going and not quit. Uh, my personal experience, I'm going to talk about some of those things tonight because we've, in our Sunday night worship, and this is the last one that we're doing this month, we will not meet next Sunday night at 7. I'm sorry, at 6. Why did I say 7? At 6. Uh, it's Halloween. There's a lot of family stuff going on. Tonight we're going to be talking about fasting. We'll have different groups. We usually have about four. I think last week we had three because we had one couple out. And that's fine. It's, we've had some wonderful fellowship. People have opened up and talked about different needs that they have. And people have been prayed for. God has answered prayer. Miracles have taken place. It's a wonderful experience to come together and, and, and sense the community that we are feeling in our life groups that we're doing on these four Sunday nights in October. Tonight is the last one. Everybody say, tonight at 6. So I hope you can make it back. We'll be talking about fasting. Uh, Margot Leneve did a beautiful job talking about prayer. Brad Johnson talked about how the Word of God's changed his life. Last week, Colby Chrysler uh, shared with us how worship has affected her. Tonight, I'm going to just give a quick 10-minute testimony how the Lord has moved in my own life in fasting and brought breakthrough and answers to prayer. And then we'll break into groups and um, you know, have some questions and pray for each other. It'll be a great time. So my quick little commercial is this. I was able to begin my journey of the loss of over 100 pounds in the last three years just by starting intermittent fasting. And I did a 16-8. That means I would go 16 hours without food and I would eat the other eight. So I would not eat after 6 o'clock at night until 6 the next morning is 12 hours, until 10 a.m. is 16 hours. Now, there was a season where fasting really sort of, sort of had a black eye, but scientific research, laboratory, um, a lot of studies of people who do this now have actually given some very extreme specifics on the benefits that take place on a cellular level. When you're fasting, not only giving your digestive system a break, but I started doing the 16-8, and once I'd gotten two or three days into it, it was just a flow. And, you know, I mean, anybody can go 16 hours and then eat the 8 and then eat clean when I ate the 8. And so the weight started coming off. And then once you start to see results, then it becomes an upward spiral of motivation, okay? So besides the spiritual principle of fasting... It has become popular again these days. Books have been written about it, especially this whole concept of intermittent fasting. Uh, I think, and, and it's not for everybody. We were back in the green room before the service started, and I had a Pop-Tart. And somebody said, or Scott Grafton said, that's not keto. And I said, keto is a cult. 
You know what, you can do anything for a short period, but you can't sustain. When you try to demonize any one of the macros, whether it's protein or carbs or fat, you're missing it because we need a balance. Somebody say amen. Now, you know, leave off your carbs for a while, that's great. But you know what, when I see you and you're angry and you're ticked off because you hadn't had any carbs, glory to God, I'll just love you and pray for you and, and hand you a cupcake. <laughs> Or maybe a Snickers bar. You've seen those commercials. You're not yourself when you're hangry. <laughs> Fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me properly aligned to receive it. Point number two, understanding its purpose. Understanding its purpose. Now, I've got some scripture, a good little bit here this morning in this section. And before I get there, I want to read the verses prior to this passage. Psalm 58 says, Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud, don't be timid. timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. Listen. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? Talking to God. We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even seem to notice it at all. The Father says, I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? Okay, so now we open up to the passage here, and it will, it's in context. It will make sense. Go ahead and put that up for me. And the Father answers his own question. He says, no. This is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. You can't fast and pray and be a good disciple of the Lord and turn a blind eye to injustice in our society. People that are mistreated, folk that have been wrongly accused, this is something that should, should stir us up. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Sometimes those are religious chains. I'm not going to chase that rabbit, but you can figure that out. That's the whole thing Jesus was talking about when he said, all of you that are just worn slap out, come to me. Come follow me, take my yoke upon you because these Pharisees have been slamming you down with unreasonable amounts of all of this hyper-legalism. They're not going into the kingdom and they won't lift one finger to help you and they're keeping you out. If you, have you ever noticed when you read the Gospels, Jesus never had an issue with sinners? It was always the religious folk. They were, all, they were always the one that were all tore up all the time because he was challenging their power base. He was challenging their political structure. All right? Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. Oh, help me, Father. I'll just be honest. I, I just, Holy Ghost, right now, I'm just so convicted because I have a relative that will call me when they need some money and sometimes I won't even answer the phone. And, you know, I, this doesn't mean let yourself be taken advantage of over and over and over again. But it also means when there truly is someone in need and you have the ability to do it, James says if you can meet that need, then that's your responsibility to do that. Don't shout me down. And Jesus said, not, I'm sorry, not Jesus, but the Father is speaking in Isaiah and the old covenant prophet, and he says, then, everybody say then. You're going to see this about four times for the rest of this passage. Then, if you'll do it this way, don't just go through the motions and penance and bow your heads and dress up in sackcloth and ashes and throw dust in the air and put on all this religious nonsense and not really have a heart change. He says, if you'll do this, then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal and your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got your back. I love that. Verse 9, 
Then when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here, he will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Quit asking for prayer requests in the name of sanctifying your gossip. Quit pointing fingers of judgment. I learned a long time ago, when I point, I've got three right here that are pointing right back at me. We need to be careful. It's one thing to, it's one thing to discern an issue in someone's life. It's something else to condemn and judge in a judgmental sense of the word. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Verse 10, feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as the bright as noon. Verse 11, the Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing ever spring. Look at your neighbor and say, I got to have me some of that. I want to tell you, when there's a famine, God says, I'll put food on your table. When there's a drought, he says, I'll, have, I'll let it rain on your land if we will have a heart that is right toward Him. And when we go through these spiritual disciplines, these motions, remember, fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me aligned so that I can receive it from Him. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Verse 12, and I think this is the last verse, yes. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. God, I, I can nearly weep reading that verse. If we can just get people to catch a vision for the Delta, if we can get people to actually love people, if we can not forget the words that Jesus talked about loving our neighbors, not hating folk because they're of a different political persuasion than we are, or because their culture is different, or they do things or see things differently, or the skin color that they have. Oh my God, why can't we remember that God loves so much the world that He gave His only Son and we're to be His people who demonstrate that. What if we had, what if we had a, a, a revival, a, a rebirth of folk that were just committed to rebuilding the, the walls that are broken down in, in the Delta? What if, what if we prayed for our, our school and its administrators instead of criticizing every decision that's made because it might be a little different than we think ought to be done? You just ought to get yourself one week up there in those positions. What if we were rebuilding instead of tearing down? What if we used our words to bring life instead of death? What if, if he says, if we would do this, then you will be known as the rebuilder of walls and the restorer of homes. Oh God, if we could just care for our brothers and our sisters, yeah, it's fine here in the house. These are our brothers. No, I'm talking about the people down the street that you don't like. Oh my gosh. And you know what? Your neighborhood's not, not so bad. Let's just go across town in the parts where you don't go. You know, it's real easy. It's real easy to get up and get a missions trip and go to some foreign part of the world and take a picture with a little brown-skinned little boy and then not love the little brown-skinned little boys in our own city. And little girls, little black boys and girls, and people that are different. He says, you can go through all these motions. You can be the evangelical church, and you can totally be disconnected from everything Jesus says. When we're hating on people all the time, and we're pointing our finger, and we're spreading rumors, and we're gossiping, and all this nonsense, people, we've got to wake up out of this. Help me, somebody. We've got to understand. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. Are you getting anything out of this this morning? We've got some biblical examples. Next point. Moses fasted 40 days, was on the mountain with God. God gave him the law. The finger of God chiseled it into the stone the first time. Elijah, Elisha both fasted 40 days. Jesus fasted 40 days. Daniel fasted 21 days till he had a breakthrough. Nehemiah, grieving over the condition of the walls of Jerusalem, called a fast. Book of Joel says, everyone, fast. Come on, cry out to the Lord. And when they called a three-day fast, the animals didn't eat. I think that the babies actually had, had the opportunity to nurse from their mothers. Those were the only ones that ate, Okay. Everybody else, a day or two, no water even, no food. We're going to cry out to God. We're going to repent for the nonsense that we've been involved in. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. This is, 
I don't know if we're going to see this nation turn until we are willing to do some of that kind of stuff because of the, the level of vitriol, the level of hatred. We have gotten ourselves wound up into a situation. I don't know how we're going to get out. It's going to take God to get us out of the mess that we have screwed ourselves up into. And I don't use that in a carnal sense of the word. I mean just tightening this thing down so hard in our views and that everybody else who doesn't think like me is a demon. God, help us. Where's the love, people? Where's the, where's the love? You know, I want to tell you something. You won't walk in that kind of love if you're tuned in to your favorite talk show host on your network 24-7. If, if I can walk in your house and that's blaring all the time, that's your problem. Fast from that mess. I, I, I turned around here a few years ago and I was so angry all the time, I had to turn it off. And let me just say something. I... I am a musician, so I love all kinds of music. I don't think there's anything. I am not a legalist. I don't think that as a Christian you ought to only listen to Christian gospel, contemporary Christian worship music. I think that there's all kinds of music that can be a blessing to you. But when the music is carrying such a spirit and a, a, a message of anger and it stirs you up and keeps you angry all the time, sometimes the best thing you can do is turn that off for 30 days and just give yourself a diet of worship music. And I promise you, long, long about day four or five, you'll start to see your attitude change and people will go, wow, what's happened to you? Because you're, you're in a good mood. I, I mean, it's amazing, folk, what we put in is going to come out. Are you hearing me this morning? Nehemiah led the people in the fast. The whole nation cried out to God. Jonah, when he was preaching repentance at Nineveh. Paul and Silas, in terms of setting them aside for ministry, went before the Lord and fasted and prayed three days. Fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me properly aligned to receive it. Now, let me just give you some quick common misconceptions because there's a lot of great stuff in the Word, multiple fasting passages that I could have gone into this morning. It's not only about food. It can be social media, it can be television, it can be news. It can be a thousand, ten thousand other different things that you think you need to have a separation from for a season. And you know what? We're not your judge and jury. You take your own temperature. You see sometimes the Lord will have you lay something down that's not even a sin just to get you disconnected from being dependent upon it. Now, let me just be the first one to, to confess my own sin this morning. But what if all the cellular service went out and you didn't have your cell phone to do what all we do all day long at different times of the day? We get, we've gotten dependent. And, and I don't believe that as believers we should let ourselves become dependent on anything. It's not about twisting God's arm. And there is no one way to fast. There's, a, there's multitudes of ways that you can do that. Last point this morning, there's some practical principles I want to give you. Number one, start small. Start with, start with an item. Start with something that you, you know that it would be best if you would get rid of. If you, if you can't get through the day without drinking a whole pot of coffee in the morning, then maybe you should consider dealing with the caffeine addiction. Not judging anybody, not condemning anybody. I think caffeine is heavenly. I think, I think caffeine is a godly thing because the whole book in the Bible is called Hebrews. God is, loves coffee. Don't, don't, don't you go out of here looking at me like that. I believe in it. I God, Glory to God, you give me a cup of coffee and I can take on hell with a water pistol. Don't talk to me before I've had my coffee though. Maybe just saying it that way shows that I've got a little dependence on it. Start small. Start with a meal. Don't commit to a 40-day fast if you've never fasted one. <laughs> go with a meal or two. Go, go a day. And this is how sometimes when I'm out of the habit of fasting, I will break into it by eating a pretty good-sized meal midday, and then I won't eat at night. So then when I get up the next morning, I will have already had, I will sort of have broken through the initial hunger pains 
while I was sleeping during the night. So if I eat about a big meal about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I don't eat anything that night, then the next day I'm sort of already primed the pump so that I can go into that day and take a whole day where I can do without. And there are seasons where I, I just take everything away, I just get before the Lord on my face, on the floor, in my upper room, in my man cave, in my study, and I'll, I'll take out the Bible and I'll play some worship and I'll play some scripture and listen to it and, and I will get on my knees. I will go. Do you have to get on your knees to pray? No, but there's something that it does for me when I humble myself and I bow myself before the Lord and it intensifies it when there ain't nothing in my stomach. And when there's something in me that says, God, I'm hungry for you. I'm blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. And when I'm doing, when I am intentionally depriving my physical body of something that it needs and it wants, it takes my prayer and it pushes it into an exponential level of touching the face of God. And I get on my face and I, I begin to pray and seek the Lord. And it's amazing how God will quicken a scripture. He'll speak a word. He'll give me an idea. He'll give me a solution to a problem that I'm wrestling with. And I'll employ it. I'll apply it. And a breakthrough will come. It doesn't have to be a complete fast. When Daniel fasted 21 days, as a matter of fact, it's called a Daniel fast where you eat no meats, no sweets. You just do veggies and fruits. But you know what? That's a good thing for everybody to do anyway. Just kind of clean out all the big heavy stuff. And not to be too gross, but we all need to give our digestive systems a little bit of a rest and, and do a little bit of a detoxifying once in a while. Don't just do without and think that that's accomplishing something. Use the time you were doing without that you would be sitting down at the table eating and seek the Lord in prayer, in worship, in Bible reading. It's not just about deprivation or abstinence, but it's about focusing that time to seek the Lord. If you're fasting from a practice, like your phone, then replace it with a spiritual focus. Do something else that is God-centered, that is focused on seeking the Lord in your life. When you're fasting food, drink lots of water. I know this is very practical. doesn't sound like a gospel message. But this is something Jesus would teach his disciples how to do. When you break your fast, break it appropriately. The longest I've ever gone without food was 10 days. Most of the time, when I'm seeking the Lord, I can get what I need to get done in my own life, humble myself, get my mind cleared, get all of the distractions out, and I can get myself in alignment to hear his voice from down here, the still small voice, and I can usually do that in about three days. It's amazing how this three-day thing works through its scripture and also works physiologically in your body. After the third day, hunger leaves. It becomes easier and easier every day after that to continue fasting. You can have any habit... And you can fast for three days and fast that habit for three days and you can break it. You can break a nicotine addiction. You can break a caffeine addiction. Now, let me just tell you right now, you're going to have some headaches on the way to it. Glory to God in the highest. You may need to supplement with a little Tylenol or a little bit of aspirin. Glory to God. But you can break anything. Three days. It's amazing what happens when you clean your body out and you quit putting in all this constant stuff. So many times we're just stuffing down. When you find yourself standing in front of the refrigerator, opening the doors, looking for something to eat, and you had just eaten the meal 30 minutes prior, it's not about food. It's about stuffing something down. It's about emotion. I was an emotional eater. I, that's, how I, that's how I can put on pounds. I can start to stuff down what I'm wrestling with, grief, and I can, man, I can pack it on. I can put it in and I can pack it on. I'm just being real, just telling you the truth. And the sooner that you can identify what it is you're really dealing with, because so many times we're just medicating a deeper pain, a more pronounced problem in our lives because we're either trying to throw alcohol at it and drown it or we're trying to throw food at it. I've never had an issue with alcohol. I can Take it or leave it. But, you know, I jokingly say, you put a cheesecake in front of me, and if there was such a way as getting drunk on cheesecake, you get me about three-quarters of the way into a New York cheesecake, and I can about be drunk on it. 
I can have a sugar high. Glory. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to be silly, but I'm just being real. Every, look, everybody say, everybody's got a flavor. When you break your fast, break it appropriately. Take as many days as you fasted to break that fast. Don't go five days and then go sit down and have yourself a big old New York strip and a double twice baked potato. Because in about two hours, you'll be groaning in the spirit. And I don't mean, a, I don't mean praying either. Y'all get anything out of this? I'm finished. Fasting is not about wrestling the blessing out of God's hands. It's about getting me properly aligned to receive it. Bow your hearts with me, please, for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to walk with and follow, be a disciple of Jesus. We want to take up the yoke that he's given to us to learn how to pray when we pray, not for people to see it or hear it. When we give, Lord, to to bless the hearts and the needs of those, not to do it in a show. Lord, when we fast, to not look miserable and just declare to everybody that we're doing without something. But God, so that when we do it in private, you would reward us publicly and openly. Lord, more than anything, we seek your face. We're hungry for you. We ask you, Father, that as we dig down deeper in this season in our local church, that you would help us to do the things that Jesus did so that we could walk in the kind of strength that Jesus did. Lord, I pray right now for those under the sound of my voice, Lord, that are struggling in areas of their lives, that you have in these moments spoken to them. You've taken a coal off of the altar and you've dropped it into their heart and said, this is an area I want to see breakthrough come in your life. Lord, an area of addiction that we may be battling, an area, Father, where we need to bring something into balance. Lord, something that we even need to cut off entirely. Lord, you speak to your people. It's not my job, not my job to point the finger or tell anybody what they should or shouldn't do in this moment, but Lord, we look to you and we ask you to help us, Holy Spirit. Convict us, Father, of the direction that we're to take. We look to you, Jesus, and thank you that as we seek your face that you will fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit as we pray and We put down the pointing finger and we stop the rumors. We deal with the oppression. We deal with those that are falsely imprisoned. And we take our food and we share it with those that are hungry. And we take the extra clothes that we have and we give it to those that are in need, Father, in our area. Let us be rebuilders of broken down walls and restorers of homes. Help us, Father, to fast the way that you would have us to fast. Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who's never crossed the line of faith and said, Jesus Be my Savior, be my Lord. Thank you, Father, that in this room right now that you lead them, you guide them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who has a need, no one looking around, every head head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room and you would say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need a breakthrough. Whatever it is, nobody has to know what it is. Slip your hand up right now. I want to pray for you. Yes, I saw that one. There's another one. Anyone else this morning? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for these who lifted their hands. We join together in faith, and I pray right now that you meet the need, the deep cry of the heart, Lord, of these this morning that are saying, Father, I need you. We know that apart from you, we can do nothing, but God, I ask you in Jesus' name that you meet the the need, the provision, God, the healing, the restoration, the reconciliation of a relationship. Lord, the the new job, the, 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 the raise, Father, the bills that need to be paid, Father, in Jesus' name, help Come alongside, strengthen my brother and my sister. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. Amen. I know that we enjoyed the word this morning. If you are a first-time guest, we would ask that you please take the Connect card at the back of the seat. Fill that out for us and give it to one of the serve team members in the lobby. And we'll get a gift in your hand as a token of appreciation for you joining us today. Also on that blue connect card, you can fill out if you're interested in serving on uh, one of our serve teams. We have the kids ministry, usher, the greeters, the media team, uh, announcers, any activity that you would like to participate in, please fill out the connect card and serve there. Also, if you decided to make a fresh start today, let us know. You can contact us at info at victorywired.com. 
Also tonight, as Pastor Mike said, that we have our last worship night is tonight. Child care will be available. And we would like to shout out our child's care, our kids ministry, for uh, working with our kids these last three Sundays. At this time, Pastor Haley will come. Hey, let me just say this. If you haven't been able to attend our worship nights, just because it's the last one, don't think that you've missed out. Show up tonight. It's going to be amazing. It's a great time of worship. We hear an amazing devotional or word from, from somebody in our congregation, and then we, we split into small groups for a time of discussion and prayer. And so it's just been so powerful. So on another note, sorry about this, guys, uh, just to, to change thoughts for a second. I, I'm sure if, unless you came in late like me, you probably saw our victory store out front. Um, we are so excited to, to open up our store to sell some items to benefit our church, um, specifically our playground. We're hoping to build a playground for our kiddos. So if you know, if you've been keeping up with us, we have started a Parents' Day Out program, and that's one of many steps toward hopefully, prayerfully, um, leading us up to a Victory School eventually. It's on our, our prayer list, our vision to have a Victory Academy one of these days. And so this is the first step, our Parents' Day Out program. So we are raising funds for our our playground and so if you are interested and want to um, purchase items we've got some hoodies we've got some pullovers and some amazing coffee mugs um, all with the victory logo on it so you'll be representing your church and then you'll also be benefiting our kiddos and so stop by our store come check it out hundred percent of the proceeds go toward this playground I can't wait to tell you guys what God has done through this that's coming up soon you're gonna hear all about it from me soon but stop by and come see me after service and I pick up some of Victory Gear. See you later. That's awesome. This Wednesday, we have Wired Youth Fall Party. It will be at 6 o'clock. The students, 7th through 12th graders, will meet at Mound City Farms, 191 Dacus Road in Marion at 6 o'clock. They will have food, games, and activities. And you can see Pastor Johnny or Megan for more information. At this time, please prepare your hearts for our last act of worship, his tithes and our offering. And we have several ways that you can do that. You can uh, fill out an envelope and drop it in a bucket as you leave the door. You can also text to give at 870-394-5990. Or you can write a check and mail your tithes in to P.O. Box 1082, West Memphis, Arkansas, 72303. Guys, have a great week, and we hope to see some of you tonight.